Hello, I'm Leslie Pierce and I'm a writer. Well, I was always good at writing. People used to say they kept letters from me because they were funny and entertaining. So I always knew I could write and I was very good at English at school. It was my best subject. But it, I think people from homes like mine just don't think that they can do that kind of thing. You just It's like being a concert pianist if you can only play a scale. You know, you're not going to think, oh, I could do that. Um, but I started writing the odd letter to magazines and things, and I got £25 once for the contents of my fridge, which was a funny letter about the rubbish I had in my fridge. And I thought, gosh, I could be a millionaire. I did four of those a week, and in no time at all, I'll have a fortune. Of course, it doesn't work like that, but I'd got the bug by then, so then I started writing short stories. Short stories led on to writing the book and I wrote three books which have all gone in the dustbin before I wrote the first book Georgia and even that took seven years to get it published so it wasn't a get rich quick scheme by any manner of means and I was 48 when I finally got ex accepted. I just had this kind of quiet conviction when I wrote Georgia. Georgia was based, I was married to a, 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 a pop musician during the 60s so I knew a lot about that way of life, how hard it is for boys getting started in a band, particularly back in the 60s, and how they can get fleeced by crooked managers and stuff. And so it was there in the back of my head, this whole story, and Georgia is a mixed race singer. And I just believed in it. I never for one moment thought it wouldn't get published. It was just a case of when. And I just carried on writing in the time while that was going, doing the rounds and getting turned down, I just carried on. But I am one of these people that always finishes things I start. You know, you, you always meet people who've half decorated a room and they don't stop or they start making a jacket or something and then they just shove it in the drawer. I always finish things. I might finish them badly, but I finish them. I think that's a secret of getting where you want to. Just do it. It was a teacher at my school. She actually wrote it on a school report and I was always telling stories at school um, usually really far-fetched ones like I'd run away from home and I was living under a hedge in a field with cows you know and things like that really totally silly stories but the other kids used to enjoy them I think they believed them as well and I used to talk about when we lived in Africa and India and this was all stuff I'd got from my stepmother who had been out there nursing in the army and a bit of Rudyard Kipling thrown in for good measure and one wonderful day, um, I got hauled over the coals for a story I'd written about how we lived in this white palace and I had an ayah. And my father rode um, a black stallion called Prince. And my stepmother went absolutely ballistic and said, the only thing your father ever rode was his bike. <laughs> and that was the end of that. I got the ruler across the hand for telling lies, you know, because it was supposed to be news, you know, real stuff. But I couldn't kind of tell the difference, really. Well, there was nothing to write about in news. I just got up, went to school, went home, went to bed, you know. So, lived in my imagination. Well, I think the thing is, I've always been quite strong. I mean, I left home at 15. I don't really have much time for sort of feeble people, you know, that just lay down and let it happen to them. So I suppose I'm halfway there to begin with, but I think the struggle is the important thing in the story. I think, you know, we all like to... It's the Cinderella syndrome, isn't it? You know, that girl that cleaned out the fireplace and that sort of thing does marry the prince in the end. If she sticks at it long enough, you know. In that case, she's, she's impossibly beautiful and she's got two ugly sisters. But, you know, I think the same thing applies. I think most of us really like that rags to riches scenario. It isn't difficult to find stories, think up stories along those lines. So I wrote that one really quickly. I wrote it in about three months. Um, the idea of, of it came from that I am a bit of a nosy person. I do spend a lot of time looking out of windows, watching other people. I mean, from here, I can't see any people from this house. That's a bit disappointing. But I have in the past taken an inordinate amount of interest in what my neighbours are getting up to. So I thought of this street I lived in when I was a nursery nurse in Bexhill. And Bexhill's a very dull place. 
and imagine this girl standing at the window watching the neighbours and there's a very glamorous woman lives across the road and she seems to have very odd visitors and that just one thing led to another and then the house gets burnt down and the girl in question, Katie, his father gets blamed for it and gets arrested and she sets to work to find out who really did it to get him off the hook. But it all started with just standing at the window looking out and wondering what people are up to and I like walking the dog sometimes, in the, particularly when it gets to autumn, when people don't draw their curtains straight away, but they've got the lights on. You walk around and you can see into people's houses and see what's... The, these sort of Victorian houses, they're too high up to see. The best ones are on sort of new housing estates. You can wander around and see all sorts of things going on. <laughs> it's very easy to imagine stuff. I'm the, I'm the same about gardening as I'm about writing and when I look around at my garden and think how pretty it is that gives me immense pleasure but also seeing a new book you know the one that's just come out and just looking at the cover and thinking well I did that and when we had the 25 years in publishing party earlier this year in June and that was incredible there was a poster there with the, all the covers of the books on you think well I, I can't actually remember writing each one of those you know that that's the mind boggles at the thought of how many thousands and millions and millions of words there are. But uh, it's a lovely feeling that you've, you've left some sort of legacy behind. They come across as all different kinds of people. One of my first fans that ever wrote to me lives in New Zealand and she's now 90. She came and stayed with me earlier this year um, when I first moved in here. Um, I first met her after writing to her for about 12 years when she was 80 and I was on a tour of New Zealand writing to her and I went to see her and took her a birthday cake and stuff and she's a wonderful old character you know but this year she'd been on a trip around the world on a cruise and I picked her up at Southampton and brought her back here and then took her to some relations of hers in Lyme Regis but um but she was English you see so she used to a lot of people I'm really very very popular in New Zealand and also Portugal for some reason. I, mean, I don't quite know what that is, but um, to them, I think it's a bit of home. They like reading about stuff in England. I don't know, is that the attraction? But yeah, they, they come from all walks of life. I mean, there's, and you know, they can be as young as 12 to 92. You know, there's no particular stereotypical Leslie Pierce fan at all. And I've started attracting quite a lot of men now. Um, I think as the story's got bar uh, a, a bit darker and the covers don't look quite so girly as they used to in the early books, a lot more men are reading them. So yes, so certainly talky to me meant fun, um, sunshine, the sea, the everything, you know. And uh, But I like it even in the depths of winter. I like nothing better than walking on the beach. I just adore it. I don't want to go and live anywhere else. Um, yes, the next one I'm basing, do you know about the, the village at Hall Sands that disappeared in the flood back in 1917? I'm basing the story around that natural disaster. It was caused by evil property developers who scooped up all the gravel and took it to Plymouth Harbour. That was what created the thing and then a terrible storm one night and the whole village was washed away. The houses have been rebuilt at the top and there's just a memorial there and a viewing platform so you can see what happened. It's about six, 16 miles from Kingsbridge. So that's what I'm focusing on at the moment. Yes, And a woman who sees the, the disaster as a way of escaping her, her life. So, yeah, she's got a shell-shocked husband that's been injured in the Somme. I can lay in bed and think all about all this, you know, <laughs> actually writing it down is the hard part, it's all very well for dreaming it up. <laughs>